to Joe from Robert. Congratulations to you on your 300th episode of Joe's Podcast. Oh, Joe, you couldn't do better, but you are, and that's what we love about you, Joe from Robert. You can do anything you want to do, guys, and if you want it done right, do it yourself. Whoa, that was a good ending. Play it again. Coming at you from beautiful Maui, I'm here to introduce Polizzi and Rose for your listening pleasure. For marketing news, trending news, all things content marketing, content creation, and everything in between for the 300th time. Joe Polizzi and Robert Rose. Take it away, boys. Well, hello, my friends. This is Robert Rose. And welcome to episode, a very special episode number 300 of PNR's This Old Marketing. That's right. We went back to our traditional name, PNR, This Old Marketing. That's right. We're here Tuesday, November 30th, 2021. And with me, as always, as he has been since November 20th of 2013, my really good friend, my colleague, and of course, really the only guy who Gary Busey wanted to sing to, Mr. Joe Polizzi. How are you? I mean, we're on video. I can actually see you for the I first know. time. I've I, I've only seen you for a show when we've done the in-person ones. We did the one in Australia. We did two at uh, Content Marketing World at the bar there at the Westin. And that's that's been it. So yeah. this is, it's going to be very hard to get through this episode. I, well, if it's I just, have to stare at not your mug for the next I mean, you're you know, very, 45 I mean, minutes. I love looking at you. I love looking at you, but it is, it is different. It is, it is a novelty. Yeah, but I'm very excited to celebrate. It's hard to believe November. November that was the date, November twentieth. November twentieth. Yeah, I went back and looked as I was wow. going back through the uh, the annals. The sort of you know, it, it was it was a little bit like the Indiana Jones, the end of Indiana Jones, when you go into that warehouse where they put the ark. You know, that's sort of our <laughs> our deep that. archives of the this old marketing podcast. And I went back into November twenty. And the funny thing is, I la- actually went back and listened to episode number one. We, um, first of all, we sound like babies. Um, we, we, we I mean, we babies. sound so young and so, you know, sort of like wide eyed and like content marketing. It could be a thing. It might be interesting. It no, I be. mean, back then I was Gen Z. Yeah. So it's really, <laughs> at least it's been a big change. Oh, I'm almost, I'm near boomer. You are. So. Well, we we're both, we're both boomers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, uh, that's the way this rolls. But anyway, it was great to, you know, some of the first stories that we covered, you know, Forbes, there was a Forbes article about, uh, you know, social media and, uh, you know, and Facebook and becoming websites and and all those kinds of things. And we were like, no, rented land and yeah. all of that. Even that far back, we were still, we were still bitching about uh, uh, putting your house on rented land. Well, you know, what's interesting is I did, I did, as you did, I went through some of the old ones. We were always very harsh on Facebook. Yes, Since the we've beginning. always been. Yes. It was the it is has been our most hated platform of any of them. And that started with episode one. So it's good to see that some things never change. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and what I would love to know is whether remember back in the old days, there were people who were putting together stock portfolios based on our our recommendations. Yes. So, so when we would do a this old marketing example. There would be, uh, you know, we would have companies, of course, that we would mention. And then there were also the platforms. And somebody actually sent us a stock portfolio that they had put together based on the, the ones that we'd That's given right. the big thumbs up to or thumbs down to. And, and we're outpacing the, the S&P 500 or the Qs or something. We should go back to that because if I remember correctly, we had American Express in there and right. we had Adobe and I think Starbucks was in there. Yeah. I mean... It's probably outperformed the market if I had just from those names right there. So, yeah. so whatever we talked about is just very intelligent <laughs> over, <laughs> over the wait. The time what are you saying? <laughs> well, what's I do? Do you remember the first 
like when we had the call, cause I was in a rental car driving yes. and I don't, you were, I don't know where you were, but we talked for almost an hour. And I remember yep. this specifically, we, we finished with the conversation and we were saying our goodbyes and you said we should have recorded that. Yep. That and was next it. week. And then that next was week it. We did. I was in the middle Same of I was driving from Palm Springs back to Los Angeles. I was in a car and we had a, we had a good hour conversation yeah. where we just, you know, we gossiped, we talked about the industry. We, we, it, it was, that was the start of the whole thing. 300 hard, I know. hard to, hard to believe, but yeah. Here, and, and no regrets. I, you know what? I, I do have this regret. I do and I don't because you you know how important that 2018 sabbatical year was for me personally. Of course, yeah. I really recharged. I love the time with the family. Um, not not that you know we spend hours on this every week, but it was more I just stopped doing everything. But it has it did take a hit to our numbers, and we've been trying to you know scratch back and claw back that audience, and still every week. So we re, we've been restarted for two years plus now that we've been doing this. And we still, every week, you and I will get a note or we'll see it on Twitter that's saying, oh my God, you're, the podcast is back. Yeah. So it is really amazing how even though when we restarted, people got the notification on whether they had Apple Podcasts or Overcast or whatever. So, oh my gosh, they're back. But a lot of them clean, <laughs> clean that out, obviously, over the two years we were not so I, I do feel bad about that because we've had to do a lot of extra work, but I do love the, the fans and the listeners that whole time that have stayed with us. And we've had our, you know, group of 20 to 25, like avid listeners that always send us notes and always send us articles and just want to thank them because the only reason we're still doing this is because people are actually listening, which is still hard to believe. It is hard to believe. I mean, you know, I mean, just to your point, I mean, I had someone last week um, tell me, you know, and this is a, a client and a friend that I've known for, oh, you know, eight years um, since we began, really. And he was a avid listener of this old marketing and then started listening when I launched the Weekly Rap podcast back a couple of years ago, which have sub subsequently stopped. He said, "Oh, I'm really sad that you stopped the, you know, the, you know, the the weekly rap podcast." And I said, "He said, you know, I, I miss hearing your voice every week." And I went, "But you're this old marketing fan, right?" And he went, "Well, yeah, but that was, you know, so long ago." And I'm like, "We've been back for two years." <laughs> and he went, "Wait, what?" And I went, "Yeah, we've been back." And he was like, "I, I, I, I he was like literally dumbfounded that he hadn't seen it." And it's just, it's such a testament to how consistency plays such an important role in what you do. Um, and, and then the second thing is, is how grateful, just to your point, how grateful I am for those who stuck with us and who have stuck with us, you know, with all our nonsense. And as we figure stuff out and we, we try and be entertaining and, and all of those things, it's been truly a, 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 a real blessing. I mean, you know, we certainly don't do this for the millions of dollars that we make. Haha, <laughs> LOL, insert emoji here. You know, it is, it is all about the love for what we, what we're doing here. And, and, and truly, you know, we're having a good time doing this. And yeah. if it entertains a few people, then it's, it's, it's all well worth it. Well, and then the final thing, and I know we've got a lot of wonderful questions to we cover, do. but the, over the two year hiatus, whatever it was a year and it um, wasn't that long. Yeah. It was a year and it was a year, and, year and four or five months, I think something yeah. like that, whatever we were gone the biggest difference is you and I didn't talk very much. That's right. Yeah. We, so we went from basically talking every week because when we started in 2013, but we started working with each other in 2008, you and I basically talked in some way every week for eight, how many, almost 10 years. Yeah. And then we stopped because, you know, you were continuing to do your thing. I was doing my thing. And we, and then, that probably played into it more, put getting the podcast back together. Cause I'm like, well, at least if we do the podcast, you and I are have mandatory talk time. Exactly. Cause people don't it's realize standing, it's a standing appointment, which was always the, it was always, I mean, that was it. Right. I mean, even back in that rental car, I was like, you know, the reason that it, this could be a show is because 
it was an excuse to talk to you every week. Yeah, it was odd. See everybody insert. Oh, yeah. You know, right. we have to have to do that, but no, it, it's been, <laughs> nobody told me there would be tears. This early <laughs> in the show. It's that's, that's, that is really true. And people don't realize too, even though our podcasts are generally an hour, hour and five minutes. Yeah. We generally spend two hours because we talk for half hour beforehand, 15 minutes after, unless we've just got to run, which you generally have a speech to give or something like that, but yeah, it's uh, we, yeah. So it's been, it's been fun getting back into the groove and it has been listeners fun. and talking to you and all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, speaking of which let's, let's, let's move into this. So just as a, as a quick housekeeping uh, tip here, thank you all again for submitting. We were overwhelmed by the number of questions, quite frankly, it was, you know, sort of like, wow, we actually have people who are listening. No, we had no idea. <laughs> Um, so what we've done for the show, just to structure the show a little bit is that we've really, you know, so for the 10 people that ultimately, and there's just spoiler alert here, there's more than 10 people. Cause there's some <clears throat> two part questions yeah. here that we, that we actually had to fit into to get it into 10 questions. Um, we'll be reaching out after the show, uh, to figure out how you get your prizes, um, and all of that, as we mentioned, we're giving away a copy of Killing Marketing, the book, which uh, I will send you a copy of the uh, Kindle version and or the hard copy version, whichever is your preference. And then, of course, uh, the lovely uh, organization at Tilt uh, will be giving away $50 worth of Tilt coin, um, which is worth $50 today and maybe worth a lot more tomorrow. It's actually Indeed. rising in value even as we speak. Um <laughs> <laughs> as the show is recorded yeah people exactly. are just buying like crazy you know if you if, if you're listening to this next year and tilt coin has crashed well you know then you can say i told you so um also what we've done is we've separated those 10 questions into two basic categories um so the first five questions um about half of the questions we got were about the industry or what we think about the business or what's going on you know in terms of predictions or our thoughts over you know the industry in general and about half were like more personal like you know what do you think about the show and how has it evolved over the years and all of those kinds of things so we'll finish the five questions about those um and uh, and just so you know as usual we're completely unprepared <laughs> Oh, for yeah. this, any of this, um, in all seriousness, we didn't rehearse our answers. Joe don't know how we, each of us are going to answer his questions. So hopefully it could get a little interesting, um, in terms of how we, uh, of, of how we, uh, of how we do this. Um, you, so you ready to roll into this? I, I have never been more ready for anything I in my life. <laughs> by the way, the, the Busey thing was good. I have to say, Oh, thank you for that. By the way, that was yes. Absolutely the perfect idea yeah. with this kind of a show. I don't know if there would be a more perfect intro person yeah. than Gary Busey. Absolutely. He was, he was top of mind, and I thought it would be so wonderful to actually just have him sing us a little ditty. And he was. Yeah, and I enough. didn't even know he was a listener to the show. And it no, was so nice that you know, he reached who out to us. <laughs> who knew? To say, um, you know, if anybody, because of course he knew we were talking about who should do the intro and it was a big deal. And yeah, wow, Mr. Yeah. Busey, we're honored. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And I also have to throw a huge shout out and big thanks to Pamela Muldoon, who has oh, yes. been our voice of introduction of Take It Away Boys for, I think, eight of the sort of, uh, well, no, it would be seven, six or seven of the years. We actually started off, fun fact, fun trivial fact, We our first few shows were actually introduced by my wife, Elizabeth, um, and, uh, and JK, uh, our, our, our stalwart uh, creative director, who, who was the one who introduced Take It Away Boys, uh, and then Pamela Muldoon, the dulcet-toned voice of Pamela Muldoon, took over a, a couple of years in and gave us the more professional, wonderful uh, voice that we have now, and has been the voice of introduction for so long and did that wonderful introductory video um, with her lovely orange hat on the beach because she now lives in Hawaii. So um, oh, all of that. So big shout out. Rubbing Thank it you in. so much, Pamela. It's just an honor to mm. have you uh, have you introduce us every week. All right. Let's get this show on the Rock road. And roll. Yeah. Um, uh, so our first question um, is going to come in two parts. Um, spoiler alert. There's a couple of these. Um, the first part is coming via the Twitter hashtag. Uh, thank you very much to Dennis Shaw, friend and family of the show. And his question is, so 
on the show for the last 300 episodes, you've advised uh, forever to not build our content house on rented land. With Web 3.0 now facing us right in the face, is it possible that the entire concept of rented land goes away? Um, what say you, Mr. Polizzi? You're a little bit into this Web 3.0 thing now. It is a it is a very important question uh, and one that I, we have sort of discussed and talked around at uh, the sold marketing. But there is going to be a rather large fight for these platforms who have multiple billions of dollars to keep walled gardens. They've worked very, by the way, this is not a unique thing to social media. There have been walled gardens ever since there've been huge conglomerates and monopolies. So they don't go to, I mean, think of AT&T, think of IBM, think of Rockefeller, right? Think of the Vanderbilts. They always want to protect build moats and you're going to see the same thing happen with Amazon and uh, with, Facebook and with YouTube and, and of course the larger Google and Twitter and everything else that's going to happen. So rented land, they want us to use rented land and they're going to be very seductive in my opinion about trying to onboard creators. So we have a choice as content creators, whether we're individuals or content marketers, we have a choice to say, do we want to leverage platforms, use them, yes, but move over to a platform we can control? Or um, do we just want to say, all right, I'm going to go with LinkedIn and I'm going to, and I'm, or I'm going to go with LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube, and I'm just going to use all rented. They're going to, Robert, I don't know what you think, but I think they're going to build in incentives enough to keep quite a few of the creators happy. I've just seen, I've seen some major deals happen on YouTube recently where YouTube has been working on Twitch streamers and trying to bring these Twitch streamers over to believe it or not, a, a more helpful uh, creator revenue stream and monetization system on YouTube than's on Twitch. So Twitch and Amazon is letting these people go over to YouTube. They're going to fight back. We don't even know the number of companies that are going to try to create creator platforms, programs, whatever. So I think over the next 10 years, you're going to see hybrids and you're also going to see a fight. And I guess the thing that I thought of was almost like Ready Player One, right? Where you have you have the metaverse where everyone takes their own digital property and own business models into this thing that's decentralized. And then you're going to have IOI. That's the controlled and you have to abide by their rules. I think you're going to see both do very well over the next 10 years. And I think creators have a really good opportunity to sort of pick which places they want to go. I think everyone knows the way I feel. I would leverage these platforms that are spending money and then move over to your own platform because as Dennis is saying, there's never been a better time for Web3 for creators to build their own platforms because of this thing called the token. And we can build these new models of, of tokenization, of creator coins, of NFTs that we never had before. But that doesn't mean we can't leverage these platforms as well at the same time. So I don't know. What, what do you think about the whole convergence going on here? Yeah, I think you're well, you know, you, you, you took the words right out of my mouth when you mentioned Ready Player One, because, you know, so the headline I would I would pose for the answer back to Dennis would be it's actually going to get worse before it gets better. Um and I, you know, and meaning that I think you're exactly right. The battle for the walled garden or the ecosystem or whatever you want to call it, that is, you know, traditionally rented land is going to explode here in the next five years, call it four to five years. And we'll see what happens there. You know, when you look at the, not the novel version of Ready Player One is actually more descriptive of this than the Spielberg movie. Because, you know, in the novel, of course, they talk about how, um, I'm forgetting the hero's name at the moment, but he he goes to school within the metaverse as well, the, the IOI's metaverse, right? And they, there's this whole thing about where he goes to class and, you know, and, and, you know, and that's all within the metaverse as well, not only just his playtime and, you know, video gaming and all of that. And it's interesting because when all the schools are there and where, you know, you start to think about that. And, and the other thing that they don't cover in the movie is all of the players that become sort of mini celebrities that build their own networks within the IOI network. 
you know, to their sort of Twitch channels within the IOI network uh, and the Oasis platform. And, and, and I think that's where we're going, right? So uh, certainly that's where Facebook wants us to go, right? To build sort of a giant Oasis-like platform where everything from online learning to online entertainment to gaming to all those things can happen within that ecosystem. And that's the quintessential you know, I mean, it's it's almost a literal translation to the virtual world of rented land, um, where you go in and rent space on this, you know, in this in this metaverse. And I think, in so many ways, if you'd been able to explore the novel of of you know of of Ready Player One or the movie even deeper, you got to figure there were other companies, right? IOI is not the only company that's there. Uh, there were others that I'm sure were there that had similar technologies that were trying to do the same thing. And I expect that to be here, right? There's going to be so many companies battling to build these places where consumers want to go hang out, um, whether that's in a virtual reality or whether that's simply in text and audio and video and all of those. The idea of the walled garden is, is, is becoming more, I think, of the norm rather than less. And I think your advice is a good one, which is, we have to fight that. We as individuals, as businesses, as, you know, we have to create our own spaces to, that are economically as well as culturally viable so that that competition is there because otherwise it becomes a little like Ready Player One where you're sort of beholden to the only thing that exists. And so that's what I love about this whole idea of decentralization and Web 3.0 is that it really does empower us to do a lot of this on our own. And, and it's going to be a bit of a, I, I think it's going to be a bit of a space race. So interesting. By the way, it's Parsable was the name. Ah, yes. There you go. Parsable. Oh, yes, exactly. Right. I should have um, remembered that. Yeah. I guess my recommendation would be, I don't know if it's sign up for a DAO, decentralized autonomous organization, but you need to start at least getting involved in the concept of digital rights because I don't know how it's going to play out. Does this like, there's a couple lands right now, sandbox, decentral land. They're big where you can buy a plot of land and then you can go yep. buy things. Well, yep. my, my thinking is when I buy a piece of digital property, I think the way it's going to work in three to five years is I can take that property into anything that can read my address. Right. And I can take that sword or that Coca-Cola or whatever it is or whatever or that plot of land in Roblox, yeah, my or crypto it is. punk that I want to mm-hmm. have as my face. And I can take that into any environment. So if we look around, I look around my desk and all the things that we own, these are all non-fungible tokens in front of me right now. They're individual <laughs> things that I own. The same thing is going to happen online. That's why maybe reading the book, Ready Player One is really good to think about how could this thing Look, because Parzival takes all of his property with him wherever he goes. He goes to school. He goes into the metaverse, uh, uh, whatever planet he wants to go to, whatever experience. And I think that the ones that play nicely will be able to work with these digital property goods. But I think that somebody like a meta, a Facebook, I don't know how nicely they're going to play. So (laughs) I love your point about it could actually get ugly. So as creators and marketers, go ahead, feel free, leverage those platforms where it makes sense, but make sure you've got something that's yours. Right. At the end of the day, which was a newsletter, right? An email list. Maybe it becomes, maybe it's NFTs, maybe it's coins or tokens in the future. Maybe it's both. Yeah. Maybe they get an email newsletter because they have your coin. I don't know. Who knows (laughs) these things? Yeah. So <laughs> who, who, who does that? Who does who does the who has a coin? <laughs> well, Crazy the this. second part of the question, uh, which is the part of the second part of the two parter, um, comes to us uh, from and and I'm going to actually, uh, Jose, I'm going to actually try and pronounce it, but you gave us permission to call you Jose D um, as a as a uh, as a as an easier way, but I think it's Jose de la Meilleur. I think that's it. So Ooh. you'll you'll tell me if I got that right or not. Um, he is a freelance uh, content writer from Belgium. Um, love Belgium, by the way. Um, works in the niche of B2B, IT, and even in deeper niches like identity, access management, IoT, artificial intelligence. And he asks, he says, look, in these niches, we're usually forced to use rented land like LinkedIn to get our messages out. 
um, what can we do to claim our own piece of land and attract visitors to it? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a short and easy one um, for you. I mean, uh, for me, it's like, it's kind of what we've been talking about for forever and ever, but what say you to Jose D? Yeah, Jose, uh, I know there's no problem with using rented land. Have something that at the end of the day, you can move off and whether that's a, I mean, in B2B could be an amazing quarterly report that you give away for free. I mean, Robert, in your some of your case studies, there are book clubs that you can sign up for that you yeah. talk about B2B companies doing. Um, and maybe it's an amazing newsletter opportunity that people sign up for. But yeah, you can go ahead and be involved in LinkedIn and build a platform. They've got some actually really good creator programs, creator publishing opportunities that are happening. I got contacted the other day by somebody at LinkedIn that says, Joe, we want to help you, you know, grow your audience on LinkedIn. And I'm like, great. I would like to grow my audience on LinkedIn too. But at the end of the day, I don't put the, the number of followers that I have on LinkedIn is not the important thing. I look at the numbers of subscribers to my newsletter. That's the thing that I, so if LinkedIn can help me get there, great. So I would say, please, if, if LinkedIn is the platform you should focus on, if you're starting fresh, you might say, I want to start on LinkedIn. I should start on YouTube because your audience, there's an audience already there. Now you then, but you have all the reach, but you have no control. So how do you take some of that control back? That means you have to offer something else of value. Oh, exactly. But along with it a little bit later after whatever, whatever the case is, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I'll just, I'll, I, I, I won't, I won't duplicate your, your, your great uh, answer there. But what I would just say is, is you have to become the, the, the brighter light, right? You, in other words, in looking at some of the well-worn and, you know, as new as AI and IOT and, and some of those things are, they are at this point, you know, very popular topics that get discussed a lot on pl platforms like LinkedIn and, and a lot of the target audience that you have go know to go to those places to get that content, which is what makes them so attractive to you in the first place, because that's where the audience is. And so what you have to become is the brighter light, right? So as you start using those platforms, luring them through the promise of better, deeper, more differentiated, you know, you know, better content, you become the brighter light. So you start using basically all of those rented land places, whether it be LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or any of those places to pull those people into your sphere of influence and, and use it to, you know, become the brighter light and become the places where those audiences want to gather. Yeah. And the, and the recommendation is you just don't be everywhere, right? You don't have to be everywhere. Your customers are at online, pick the one or two or three places. I think max that you're going to spend time putting up your listening posts, putting up your regular content so you can build an audience and then move that audience over to something that you can control later. Uh, yeah. The ones that are mediocre and everything. And, you know, as our friend Doug Kessler says, it's a mountain of meh content. Don't, don't fall for that trap. More content does not mean better. Focused strategy, those things work a lot better than just scattering it everywhere. Exactly. So. Exactly right. All right. On to question number two. Uh, and thank you, Jose D, for that wonderful yeah. question. And of course, thank you, Dennis, for your wonderful question. Um, the prize is in the mail. Um, anyway, question number two comes to us also via the Twitter hashtag. Uh, got a lot through the Twitter hashtag, which was lovely. Um, Jared Opfer uh, is our questioner. And I know you know Jared, uh, mm -hmm. Joe. Uh, the question is, what business uh, had the biggest miss in the last 12 months? And which business has the biggest opportunity? in the next 12 months. I definitely have it. Uh, oh, I one think you for should. Each so, of those. so you go, you go for, I've been going first. You go first. Okay. I'll go first. So uh, I, I know that, I don't know if this is going to come as any surprise to any longtime listener of the show. I think the, the one for me that is the biggest miss is clubhouse. Um, clubhouse is I've said it before. I will say it again. And you know, if, if we had time, I would go into detail on this, but Clubhouse is the Quibi of 2021 and 2022. Um, it, <laughs> That's such a low blow. Yeah. You're it so is, mean. It is, it is headed, it is headed distinctly in that direction. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. And we can discuss in more detail on a yeah. different episode. Um, the one I think had the uh, biggest opportunity um, to me are the, I'm going to put it in a category which is the infrastructure platforms for Web 3.0. And there are a number of them out there. And I don't mean the sort of 
stuff that's happening out here in the fashionable NFT world. I think those are interesting, certainly, but those are those are going to come and go like the wind. The ones I think that have the best opportunity for long-term success are the infrastructure platforms that are building basically the pipes and wiring and infrastructure for where, you know, where we're going with Web 3.0. An example of that is Brave. Um, and I think Brave is a really interesting company. Um, it's, they've got a browser that is, that is looking to be very privacy focused. Um, it's also got an ad blocker built into it. It's going to be built on blockchain technology, or it is built on blockchain technology. They've already got an ad network running with a, uh, you know, with a social token, or a, I, sh I should really call it a, a token, just full stop, um, of their BAT, which stands for basic attention token, really interesting platform. If you haven't checked it out, you should check it out. And the other category I would put into that is uh, fintech. Uh, fintech is just exploding right now. And I think probably the most well-known company and certainly in the news as we record this um, with Jack Dorsey retiring uh, from Twitter as CEO, but also moving on to focus on Square. I think Square is probably the biggest opportunity right now in the fintech space. It's you know, I mean, it's, I think it's worth 90, $95 billion as we, as we, uh, as we go on air here. I think that number easily doubles in the next year. Oh, I, I would agree with that. <clears throat> and I think that Jack has been very um, forward thinking about the use of crypto. And as the crypto network, Bitcoin network continues to grow, they're going to have a huge opportunity at Square to take a lot of that market share just to handle some of those transactions, those yep. millions of transactions. Absolutely. Uh, well, okay. I have to rebut on Clubhouse. The <laughs> jury is still out, folks. Uh, there are a lot of creators that are doing really, really well on Clubhouse. If you focus, you can't dabble in Clubhouse. It is not a thing where you can go in for a couple of weeks and see that, that you know, are they working? Are they not? You have to stay there. The ones that have stayed there have done really well. I'm just going to put that out there. We'll see next year when we do our special holiday episode. I don't think the, they'll do poorly, just to be clear. I don't think the people who are on Clubhouse and sinking their time into it now will do poorly. I believe Clubhouse will do no, poorly. Okay. I we'll, think at we'll, some point it will become such a barren wasteland and the tumbleweeds will start to blow through that those people who are doubling down right now and getting value out of it will have sucked all the value out of it and we'll move on. All right, well, we'll... We'll see. A lot yeah. of players in that area. Uh, Wisdom is another app that just launched recently that's, that's trying to take over a lot of that, which is another interesting model. But all right. So biggest miss. This is a little one. Uh, how Apple never created any kind of helpful search for podcasts is beyond me. Like that's something that I think about a lot, that there's no real podcast discovery worth its salt today. Uh, there are a lot of players trying, but Apple had that opportunity and they completely blew it. And I think they've rendered everything else to, even though they're doing something, Spotify has, has just run right over Apple when Apple had the, you know, they, they were, they had 10 yards to go in the hundred yard dash and, and they, and they, they've lost yep. this race, which is hard to believe. Uh, Meta Apple has blown search full stop. Yeah. And there is not, Thank there yes. is no such thing as a good yes. Apple search. Even the exactly. navigator on your computer is not that great. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I think Meta, Facebook has blown it. He's known for a long time that he wanted to get into the metaverse. He's been talking to it and why they haven't purchased something like Dapper Labs or invested in Sandbox is beyond me. Like they should be the, the they've got so much money. Why aren't they not already investing in that instead of head and hedging their best instead of just doing this proprietary stuff. And we don't even know what they're doing besides Oculus. So I think that that's a loss. Of course, how Apple never bought Disney is beyond me. <laughs> this is probably the biggest miss in all of media that's ever, ever happened in our lifetimes. There was, and by the way, you know this, we talked about it. When, when Disney really dipped during COVID was the last possible time. Disney dipped way, way more than Apple because of Disney World. People thought that Disney was going out of bit, not out of business, but they were really going to be hurt. And they were because it did. Disney World was so cheap and accessible at that time. And I don't think people at Apple were, they could have sweetened that deal, doubled that, and it had been dimes to them. So I'm just going to put that out there. Well, yeah. Huge, I mean, huge missed opportunity. You can go back 300 episodes and we were talking about, <laughs> about this yes. on this show. Um, so this is the opportunity, I believe, in the future. By the way, Jared, 
uh, is from my hometown, Sandusky. Went to my high school. He's quite a bit younger than I am, though. So thank you for the question. Um, I think the big opportunity that you're going to see, and and maybe you're that they're missing the boat right now. We talked about creator programs a little bit ago, but what's happening with a lot of these creator programs, and I'm not going to, but if you look at what LinkedIn is doing or what YouTube is doing, they're fine. They're doing a fine job teaching content creators how to build on their platforms, but they're not teaching them how to be content entrepreneurs, how to really build a business. I think they're missing out. I think you, if you're going to do this and really go all in and you believe in the creator economy, the YouTubes of the world and the Amazons of the world, they should be investing in content creators themselves instead of just saying, oh, use our platform to do this, this, and this. Let's teach you how to make more money. Let's teach you the new business models. Let's teach you basic content and web operations. They're not doing that. They're doing 5%, kind of what people use marketing automation for. They buy marketing automation and use about 5% worth. This is exactly what a lot of these big platforms are doing. And I think they're missing out on a huge opportunity. There's such a gaping hole for somebody to come in with a billion dollars and say, we are going to help you content creator, content entrepreneur, and they're going to take a lot of that creator business. So, well, there you go. Yeah. There, you go. there you go. I mean, I won't even get into the whole... Disney and Apple. No, thing. you can't. Yeah. You can't get into it because there's nothing to say. There's nothing. You just say, like, Joe, you were there. There never was say, anything there. You could, you could say that now there's no point to that conversation because Disney's too valuable. Yes. But there was a time, there was a time when it made too much sense. And now here you go. And the only thing, the reason why Apple TV plus has been successful. Oh, is see, I've already of, started him down the path. So because he, he wasn't going to say show. anything and then he did. <laughs> why? Why the only reason Apple TV Plus is successful is why Ted Lasso. That's it. They didn't yes. have Ted, Ted Lasso morning they show, and but yes, all right, fine. Morning yeah. show, that's fine. It's fine. Ted Lasso is the reason why people have of signed course. up to subscribe, Apple TV right. Plus. Absolutely, subscribe to that. And they could have had the how many subscribers does Disney Plus have? A lot, 120 million or a something lot. like but that. But they were never going to sell just that part of it. And Disney is more than the theme parks and the business. And there are 8,700 other businesses that Disney owns, including finance businesses and furniture businesses. And I mean, like, I mean, they're in every business, right? Their their portfolio is is huge in terms of what they had, and they're just way too comp- complicated for for anybody to buy. Well, what business is Apple in? I, I, yes, Apple's in the uh, finance agreed. business. But Apple's Apple in doesn't the product need, business. No. Apple's in the merchandise business. They're in all the same businesses. You just yeah. like Apple better. You are discriminating no, just, against the, the fine folks at Disney. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to our next Let's question. Let's do that. Let's move on. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, and uh, this one's also in a two-parter, but the two-parter, the second parter is a one, literally a one-word answer that should not open up this kind of debate that we've just been having uh, for the last few minutes. Um, <laughs> it comes from our good friend, Bernie Borges, from uh, the contact form, actually, on the website, so through email. Um, and the, the question that Bernie has is, he's looking for examples of blockchain solutions for B2B, and he doesn't see them. Um, all the talk about brands planning for NFTs or B2C brands like Disney and Starbucks. Uh, what can B2B brands like HubSpot, Oracle, and CMI do on the blockchain? Should they mint social tokens? What's your take? Um, you got a quick take on this? My quick take is, and, and we do this, you and I have done it before, we get, we get hooked into the technology, into the end product of NFTs, of social tokens. But if you're a B2B company right now, what you're doing is, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish? What's our business objective? What's our marketing objective? Do we want, we're trying to engender more trust? Do we need to generate awareness of some kind? Do we need to create more valuable customers? What is that? And then you could say, oh, well, do social tokens make sense? And then you might say, let's take an Oracle or a Cisco systems. Maybe would it make sense to have some type of a reward program built on the blockchain that engenders trust, that gives exclusive access to information at those companies or expertise at those companies? Absolutely. It would totally make sense to do that. Are we going to see that? Yes. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than Starbucks create, taking their rewards program and throwing it on the blockchain, which by the way, they will do and will happen in the next two years. But any all the innovation right now in this space is happening with individuals of very small companies because they're willing to take the risk. They're willing to try things. Public companies, this is this is a 
this is a tough thing to chew for a lot of public companies. Brand new. It's just like, think about Walmart getting into the e-commerce space. You know how long it took them to, to make that jump? They stayed hands off and let Amazon just roll with that market for about five to seven years. And then when they were ready and everyone was comfortable and it was part of the culture, then they went and did it. So these things, I don't know. I mean, do you even think that you're going to see a big B2B, like a real, not a gimmicky thing, like a real B2B blockchain launch around social tokens or NFTs in the next year? Oh, I do. I like a real one. Not I absolutely do believe okay. that. Yes, I absolutely do believe that. I mean, my take on this for, for Bernie is basically, I think we'll see it sometime mid to late next year. Um, maybe wrong and maybe earlier than that, but I would guess mid to late next year that there will be some level of B2B launch, not in the NFT space. I don't see an Oracle or a HubSpot. I mean, HubSpot maybe because HubSpot does weird things like this, but but a you know a traditional classic B2B heavy industry or manufacturing company or those kinds of things. It's not going to be like a special NFT launch or something like that because their customers are other businesses. It will rather be in something like either through secure access to applications. It will be in customer experience and trying to build in tokenized um, ways of using customer experience to obfuscate customer data. Um, that's a yep. project that I'm working a little bit on right now in the background here, talking a little bit about um, that's I don't have anything to announce yet, but certainly um, something that I'm working on for the new year is going to be talking about how customer experience and tokenization are sort of meeting and how do we start to create loyalty and databases of audiences that don't require email addresses as an example. So I think there's a lot going on under the water, just under the water. And I think you'll see some of it start to surface toward the middle of next year for these, for these B2B organizations. Yeah. You, you may, maybe you're right. If you look at it, I mean, you and I both said, I mean, it won't be a consumer play, right? It's not going to be like an NFT of the Oracle logo and buy it. And it that's, get, it'll that's be like tickets to an event, or it'll be, you know, much more of what, uh, you know, something like, the stuff that you're working on, the stuff that uh, Gary V is working on, those kinds of things where what you're buying as a business when you issue your PO is access. I could very easily yeah. see, for example, a Gartner or a Forrester uh, offering up subscriptions to their thought leadership Absolutely. to other businesses for it, it, using some sort of coin in replacement of dollars because it's easier for them to portion that out. In other words, you get one big PO for a couple of hundred thousand dollars that gets you XYZ number of tokens that are on the blockchain that can be spent and burned as you need to go through visiting with an analyst, downloading a white paper, sure. all those kinds of things. The one thing I will say, I just got off a call before this. We we're talking about ed educating executives about content marketing. And they were asking me what it was like in 2000, 2001, 2002. I said, it was a bear. To just get, because we, so then we focused to sell our custom magazines to people that got it. That was like 1%, 2%. And content marketing is not that hard of a concept, but right, this is 10 times harder. So you need a lot more education. So I could see why it's going to move slower. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And the second part, which we can answer very quickly um, is simply Bernie asks, when does Meta acquire Disney? Right. And Goodness gracious, I hope that doesn't become the next 300 shows debate. But um, the answer, my answer is never. Bernie, thank you for bringing that up. And we'll <laughs> we'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> All right. Question number four. Uh, it comes to us from Eddie. Uh, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Eddie uh, Naranjo. Uh, and uh, via the contact form on the thisoldmarketing.site. So thank you for that. The question is given the current transition from Web 2 to Web 3, which business model would you say is best to bootstrap a new business for someone who loves WordPress design, content marketing, affiliate marketing, really curious around crypto and all those kinds of things? What business model would you would you recommend? I'll quickly go first because my answer is very short here, which is it's the same business model as before. Everything we've been preaching, which is build your audit, find your niche, find your tilt, 
get that, build your media platform, build your audience, and then figure out the products and services that are going to meet the demand of what it is yeah. you want to build. It's the same business model we've been we've been preaching. It's a it's a great backbone for you to start from, and uh, and, and it's one that's proven successful. Yeah, and I would just add to that and say you're only focusing on half the sweet spot. Half right. the sweet spot is your expertise area. The other half is the audience's des- desire. That's right. That is the key part of it, actually. So let's focus. So take all those skills you have, but let's focus on an audience where you want to, you know, take those skills out of the box and really do something. But that's where I think you're, if you, if you start focusing on an audience, then the business model will really present itself. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Eddie, for that wonderful question. And let's move on to the last question of our industry biz side of things. And it's a great one. I think that also helps Mm -hmm. us sort of transition into the more personal side of things. And I just love this question, mainly because I'm a MarTech geek. Um, and and, and uh, it's from Yen Yi, um, who asks, uh, basically, uh, and asks this question, by the way, via the hashtag on Twitter, what's the current content marketing stack, the technology stack for CMI content, for the content advisory, and for the tilt? Um, I, I absolutely love this question because mm-hmm. You know, it's it's both a large enter, larger enterprise, a small consulting firm that's been around for a, quite a while, and a your company, a startup, you know, media and services company. Um, so, you want to start with the with the tilt, the the quick rundown of the stack. Yeah, I, and then I can't, and maybe you can speak for for CMI. I can't. I can. Yeah, I can speak. Okay, for CMI. then you can. Great. So you take CMI because it's been a few years since I've been around uh, yeah. the stack there. So for the tilt, uh, our email solution is ConvertKit. Uh, we have SparkLoop is our referral system. So we wanna get more subscribers and we use Sparkloop to track all those things, which integrates actually with our uh, cryptocurrency, our Tiltcoin as well. So we we reward people with Sparkloop with our referral system for signing up. And of course, that's how it all works together. We use QuickBooks for finance. Uh, Rally.io is our creator coin um, that we use for our cryptocurrency. Optin Monster is who we use for our popover and then for our uh, hosting. Uh, platform on the podcast specifically, we use Libsyn. So this podcast that you'll listen to, we use uh, Libsyn and we, we have ever since the, the start in, in 2013. So I don't know if I missed any of those categories, Robert, but that's generally, you know, we, we started this company in April and that's pretty much what we're starting. We'll probably hang with this for a while too. Yeah, it's those. It's a it's a great stack, and 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 all, m- many of those I'm familiar with. Interestingly, none of which uh, uh, I'm using at the moment, um, which is I think good in, in a way because yeah. it gives us a little more breadth here. So uh, so Yen for the uh, for CMI content, um, they are bigger solutions as you might expect because now CMI being part of the Informa family sort of has adopted all of their sort of enterprise level technology. So. Uh, for them, uh, marketing automation and email is done through Eloqua, uh, which is the Oracle solution, of course. Um, then there's for CRM and audience management, they use salesforce.com um, and sort of the marketing cloud associated with all of that. Google Analytics uh, on the analytics side, and they have a new CMS that they're putting in, which I won't call out right now because I don't know how public that information is, but they are in the transition for a new enterprise content management system that will uh, that will that will now power the the CMI site for TSCA. Um, we have we're we're basic basic pretty much all the way through WordPress for all the websites yeah. that we run. Um, I have Kajabi for one of the client only websites, which has education and stuff like that. Uh, we're adding in. We have Mailchimp for our email newsletter currently. But we're adding on to the Twitter review um, as our new email engine, and that'll start to go live um, with a new project that I'm not announcing here yet um, in, in the new year. Um, and then there's uh, Google Analytics, of course. We don't have really a CRM because the number of clients that we have is relatively small and we can manage them pretty pretty easily. But we do use Monday.com for project management and client management. And then we're basically for infrastructure, we're a Microsoft shop. So we use Outlook, um, we use Exchange Server, we use uh, Teams for file collaboration and team meetings and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. We're a little more old school that way than the Gmail stack of, uh, of anything like that. Yeah. Mostly just because I hate Google Docs and Google presentation and Google everything office related. Just, you know, I just, I'm, I'm you know, call me old that way, but that's, uh, that's our stack. Yeah. 
I, and by the way, I forgot. Yeah, we we're WordPress specifically WordPress on everything. Everything we launched with we're, all of yeah. our sites are WordPress. Google yeah, WordPress Google. is fantastic. Yeah, we're Google. We've been since the beginning since 2007. We've been on on G Suite. Uh, oh, like I, know. It or not, I know. Like it or not, I know. I know. It it is it is a thing. Um, yeah. So not is my question. <laughs> If Apple, if Apple had good mail, that you'd be using Apple Mail. I I would be. I, I love Outlook. Outlook. I mean, Outlook now for both the iPhone and and I'm Macintosh when it comes to all the hardware stuff. Um. So, but Outlook for the Mac and Outlook for especially Outlook on the phone is so much better than Mail. It's just so much better. Oh, so, okay. especially Calendar. Calendar is like is like night and day. Um, I wouldn't, there yeah, has I wouldn't never know. been a good Mac calendar. It's just for business. It's, it's not, it doesn't exist. Um, well that, I mean, yeah. speaking of technology, that transition uh, helps us get into our uh, wonderful sort of uh, more personal, more show oriented questions. But before we do that, uh, we've got to recognize our wonderful sponsor we who do. stepped up and sponsored this wonderful 300th episode. You know, um, you and I have both done, uh, Edu- webinars and educational programs with Parsley. And I just wanted to send him a shout out. So David, we reached out to David at Parsley, by the way, it's P-A-R-S-E dot L-Y. So when you type it in and you go to everything we say in this little promo, but I was, it was just very nice. I just said, Hey, we're looking for a 300th episode sponsor. And he didn't even hesitate. He said, absolutely. So uh, we wanted to do this wonderful read and now we'll do this and then we will thank them again. So Parsley is your content team still split between creative types and numbers people. How it many is, people, Joe, yes, it is, it is split that way. This is wonderful. How many, you see, usually I do these and nobody talks back, but in this case, you're going to talk back to me. <laughs> How many people on your team actually use Google analytics every day? A lot. Okay. okay there you go. Parsley is a content analytics platform built to make it easy for your writers, creators, and marketers to become data-driven. Make it easy for your team to understand what content drives conversions. Make it easy for them to see what's working and to do more of that. Make it easy to prove the impact content has on your business every day. In one study, a 40-person content team only had eight people using Google Analytics frequently. In other words, they weren't data-driven. They switched to Parsley. Now 33 of the 40 people are using Parsley to drive results in their business. And it's just that much easier. They're no longer split between creative types and numbers people. They are both. If you're ready to start understanding the true value of your content and get out in front of your competition, get a free content analysis from a Parsley that's P-A-R-S-E dot L-Y product specialist by visiting Parsley slash Joe. I'm sorry, Robert. <laughs> it's just Parsley slash Joe, P-A-R-S-E dot L-Y slash J-O-E. <laughs> and you can go and get your special Special 300th episode with the, I like the call to action is just Joe. Uh, Yeah. Well, so much of my life is just Joe. I know. But anyways, the tilt is not quite big enough to have parsley, but I would like to get there very soon. It's a great product. It's a a chance. I've had a chance. I've had a chance to see it quite a bit. It's really, really good. And if you have people on your content team that you're actually trying to bring together so they understand the numbers, which is hard to do for some some creative people, this is a really, really good tool. So, it's a great tool. It's absolutely a great tool. Yeah, TCA is a little small for it as well, but it's, um, but you your know, clients, I've, I've, ma- I've made it a recommendation not, many yeah. of our clients. So uh, it's a, yeah, it's it's a great tool, beautiful versions and, and much easier to understand than much of the analytics tools that are out there. Very good. So thank you, David. Appreciate you stepping up for this. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, thank you, David, yeah. even though, it was all about Joe, which it seems to always be. It's I may always... have had something to do with that. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. I understand. Yeah, I I, I, I follow you. All right. I, all right. Um, I could do my best, Robert. Shaw, it's it's yeah, the same follow. thing. It's the same thing as Joe Polizzi on the cover of Killing Marketing. Yeah. Yeah. The same there thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the story of my been... life, folks. This is yeah. the way this is the way it's worked for. That's why we years. get along so well. I know. Actually, second billing. That's the way it always works. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's move on to our next uh, few questions here so that we can uh, we can get this uh, 300th done here. And we uh, have an audio question. This our first audio question comes from Annie Schiffman. 
Uh, and it's uh, it's a really good one to start us off on this second half of the show. So, Annie, what is your question? Hi, this is Annie Schiffman from Downstage Media. And I've got a question for you, Robert and Joe. So how has the show evolved from the first 100 episodes to the second 100 episodes to the third 100 episodes? If I were to look at the 99th versus the 199th versus the 299th episodes, for example, how would you say they're different from both what we hear and what you've done behind the scenes? Thanks, gents. All right, Joe. It, uh, that's a it's a good one. Um, which is, you know, how have how, how have you seen things evolve? Like from ninety nine. Here's I'll tell you what. I, I'm going to answer this first because you go first. I, the the funny thing is, is that I actually thought of this when you were teeing up the beginning of the show. If ninety nine episode ninety nine. If you go listen to that, you can tell we're still trying to figure things out. We were playing with things. We were changing up the order of things. We had, you know, sort of added the introduction and then went to the cold open and then changed theme music. And, you know, we changed the, some of the format right around then. 199, I would say, was us, you know, sticking, sticking it, right? We were sticking the yep. landing every show and it was great in our prime, growing audience, doing fantastic. And in 299, we're figuring things out again, right? Just as you said, right? Be coming back, we're still figuring out how to build audience. We're still figuring out how to play a little bit and, and figure out stuff. So I think, you know, the one to hopefully provide a little bit of a more satisfying answer for Annie, I think the, the true evolution of the show has come in bits and pieces. We haven't ever made like sort of full throated big changes but we've made tweaks throughout the years that we've sort of enjoyed more that helps us record, become more efficient, become more effective, you know, thinking about the way that we segment the show and all those kinds of things. And I think if you listen to us in the very beginning, what you would hear is lots of case studies, lots of observations about what was going on in content marketing. And as we've grown into it, I think what we've become is a little more uh, sort of news oriented and sort of covering our opinion of, you know, what we think of what's going on in yep. the news. And I think that's probably the the biggest evolution that I'll, I, I can notice anyway. Yeah. I mean, and I think what's important though, is we've stayed true to the pretty much the format yeah. the entire time. It's based off of a pardon the interruptions for sports center. That was the whole yep. idea where they cover the news and they give their takes on it. And initially, if I, if I thought about the biggest change, Robert, Initially, we covered more stories and we thought that it was really important for us to We Now we cover less stories and we do more analysis. Yes, and that our, is true. The way that we differentiate our content tilt, if you will, is the fact that we have some very interesting takes. You both, we've both been around a long time. Maybe we're wise in some circles. Maybe we're buffoons in other ones, but we give our own analysis and it's an, it's our very own unique analysis to each story. So instead of six or seven news stories, we generally do three, sometimes two. Um, and then the only other thing that we do is we, we got rid of this, this old marketing example at the end. And we really have spent yeah. more time on the rants and raves at the end of the program, which as you say, every time is the most popular part, which who knows, but you think it's the most popular part. And, uh, and so that's there have I been see. research studies done out of the yeah. wonderful this old marketing labs up in the Silicon Valley, California, where they have yeah. empirically proven that rants and raves are the favorite part of the show. So, but you're right. We always are trying to learn. Uh, I yeah. think we've, we've got a little bit more confident, but the, 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 plat, the, 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 the programming itself has pretty much stayed the same. And I think that's been an important part of our success. We found that hook really quickly. And now we're just trying to play with the middle parts to see what resonates the most. I think that's it. I think, you know, so it's one of those things where if you like us, you'll like the show. And if you don't like us, I mean, and, and every time we get a bad review on, and there've been plenty of bad reviews uh, on, on all of the platforms, you know, anytime we get a bad review, it's because they don't really like us. They don't want to, you know, they, and, and that's, that's fine. That's, that's, that's more than fine. I know um, a lot but, of people that don't like us. It's, yeah, it's totally I mean, fine. So, but if you, if you, <laughs> if you, if you, if you like us, generally speaking, you'll, you should like the show. Cause it's, 
you know, it's easy. It's background noise for a lot of people. And I totally get that. And it's basically every now and again, we say something either, you know, pithy or snarky or funny or entertaining. And in some ways to make you laugh or think or do something a little differently. And that's been the magic for the, you know, for 300. All right, let's move on and let's get to our next question. Question number seven. Um, is from Esben Johansson. Um, hi, Esben, big friend and family of the show hey, for a long time, um, coming via the Twitter hashtag. And if it's one thing we could go back, if there's one thing, Joe, you could do to go back and change our book, Killing Marketing, what would you add to the book, Killing Marketing, if you could go back and add anything to it? Well, knowing what we know now, <laughs> sorry, there, first of all, there's one really important thing that we did, and our wonderful publisher, McGraw-Hill, did not like Killing Marketing yeah. as the name. And you and I were, it used, the original name was Marketing Profit, if right. you believe it. Or, how boring is that? True, true statement, but boring. And you and I stuck up for Killing Marketing and really going after that and believed that we wanted to make a statement and I think that that ultimately worked for us. If I yeah. had, to, knowing what I know now, it would have been something on tokenization, but we didn't see that coming. This no. is a very, Web3, it was a glint in our eye at that point. Um, but I felt we challenged people a lot and still do. If you are a regular chief marketing officer or marketing director and you read that book, it's, a, it's still an eye-opening book. Because it's where we made the comparison and said, look, you are really are a media company and that comes with responsibilities and you can deny that you're a publisher as long as you want to, but you are. You're yeah. creating more content than anything else you're doing. Are you just going to half-ass it for the rest of your career? You can either do that, it's an option, or you're going to get serious about it. Yeah. So what did, yeah, did no, we miss I agree something? With you. What, did, what did we miss? Uh, we didn't miss anything, I don't think. I, 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 I think having to do it over again, I would have leaned in even harder to the idea of completely rebooting marketing as a profit center. Um, you know, cause we, it's not like we soft peddled it at all, but I think we could have even like gone harder and more passionate, you know, cause it's, it's one of those things you, you never know how that's going to land. Um, and, and it, and it landed well. And I think we could have leaned in harder. The more, I think the more pragmatic thing and sort of a, a, a kind of an ironic twist here is that I wish we had put in more um, of what we teach now. Some of the more pragmatic templates, the, you know, the processes, the, you know, the ways to go, you know, like say how to do it, um, which we understand a lot better now, but would have been great if we could have sort of paused and figured that out before, you know, bef- and put in the book. Maybe that's uh, the next version. Well, that would be the second edition. If I ever, you know, ever voted on it, it would be, it would be to go in and actually do here's, you know, here's your roadmap. Basically here's here, here's your roadmap of how to think about this. Cause this is what I spend so much time now working with clients on and, and we have a pretty well-documented process for that now. So it's, it's uh, it's, it's where I'd go. Well, if if we do the next one, you can have the primary author then. (laughs) That would just confuse Amazon for sure. Um, <laughs> like which forever is Amazon Rose was Polizzi confused book that I was Polizzi even a co-author Rose on the thing. So it's like, you know, I don't know what to do. <laughs> oh, shoot. All right. Uh, here's question eight. Um, question eight comes to us courtesy of John Morgan, comes via the email contact form. Um, of all the trends that we've covered over the last eight years on the show, which Joe has been the most surprising and what has lasted that you didn't think would last? I guess I would say I did not think that print would continue to be so strong in 2021, 2022. I, now you might be thinking, what print? Bear with me now. Go look at the direct mail spending and go look at what Amazon and Walmart are doing in the catalog space mm. and go still look at the amount of custom magazines that are created. It, I had no idea that even with the rise of digital, digital is incredibly important. We think digital first, there's no problem with that, but the oper- this still opportunity exists to create an amazing relationship with somebody through the print media printed form. Um, and you're seeing, you know, Lego magazines still go strong. You're seeing Red Bulletin magazines still go strong. These, uh, these, have been going on for a long, long time. Why? Because they work. 
So I, I didn't think print would still go. I never thought the second thing is I never thought Pinterest would grow to be a dominant platform and point poised for real growth on the e-commerce side. I never saw, I thought that that was a, what you probably think a clubhouse now. I, that's what I thought of Pinterest. I'm like, Oh, come on. I'll put my infographics there. Who cares? So those are the, those are the many, those are the things. And I guess the one surprising thing for me is I thought we, even though we're starting to see it, I thought we'd see way more acquisitions for product and service companies, buying media companies and content creators. We are, you know, we talk about them, you know, hustle, HubSpot, Air sure. electronics, but there's simply not as many as there should yeah. be. I'm so we've been talking about that since over 10 years now. So how about you? Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest thing for me is, in the surprise category is how, you know, and for those of you who've listened to the show for, for any amount of time, you've heard me rant on this is sort of the, the lack of uh, acceptance of the process or the reticence actually, I guess, of the process or recognizing it as such um, from everybody that is sort of outside the, you know, the sort of you know, call it outside baseball, if you will. Right. So, you know, and largely, I mean, Madison Avenue on this and, and, and much of the, what I would call the, the Madison Avenue ad industrial complex um, on the idea of content marketing, right. And, and how, and how it has remained such a, it, it's, it's almost like this uh, well-known thing that's not well-known, right? So if you walk into big brands, I mean, really big brands, the biggest brands in the world, the Facebooks, the, you know, GMs, the uh, GEs, the AT&Ts, the Microsofts, the, you know, just the biggest brands on the planet. And you ask the CMOs or you ask the, the marketing practitioners, have you heard of content marketing? Do you know about content marketing? The answer is absolutely 100% yes. They know about it. They think about it. They look at it that way. But nobody outside the world really of our small-ish community really speaks to it in that way. You know, it really speaks to, you know, you don't see it in ad week. You don't see it in the Wall Street Journal. You don't see it. You see the examples, but they just don't call it content marketing. No. You see all kinds of things that have to do with content marketing, but it is not called content marketing. I was so, I mean, it's, it, you know, it gives you a shot of adrenaline when you hear somebody like Professor Galloway actually use the words in his podcast because you're like, yes, finally someone in that world is saying the words. And so I guess that's my biggest surprise is that just for whatever reason, the term hasn't taken off with media. It is amazing to me how long things take to change. Yeah. It is. It is. It, I guess maybe that's the biggest surprise, right? I mean, we've been at the, I've been at this for over 20 years now in this industry. You and I have been talking about it in public since 2008. Yeah. Plus. Um, but it's, it's much easier to stay, to be the status quo for people and stay yeah. there. Um, and, and a lot of people don't understand. I mean, it, look at the big agencies. Big agencies have a tough time grasping around the, a new business model of offering brand publishing or content marketing to people. It's vi I don't know if it's more difficult. I would say it's more difficult. I don't know if it's more difficult, but it's a lot different than having the oh, big brand idea, the big ad idea. You know that. You come from a lot of that world, especially in Hollywood. This is the way we do things. And you've got somebody else coming in here saying, oh, there might be a, a, diff a better or different way to do it. And they don't want to hear it. It's absolutely more difficult, is absolutely more difficult. As I've always said, it's way more difficult to launch a content marketing, you know, a, you know, owned media property that is interesting and builds value because it's literally a media product that generates value and is way more difficult to do that than it is to make, you know, an ad um, of any kind. Yep. It's just, it is, it's, it's just definitively more, well, more difficult. Just on, a, on a similar note, we were talking beforehand about why some Financial advisors don't wrap their arms around the idea of crypto or Bitcoin because they can't, they have trouble making money from it. That's right. It is a different model for them. They have to really get creative to figure out how their services can be useful to this next generation of investors. Yeah. So, and by the way, when that happens, big opportunity for everyone listening to this. Exactly. Because if you're willing to change faster than 50% of the people, you've got a big opportunity. Yeah, so absolutely right. Absolutely right. 
All right. We're getting toward the end here. There we go. Question number nine. This one's another audio question. Uh, and it comes from our friend across the pond, as it were, Mr. Ian Truscott. Hi, Ian. How are you? I hope you're doing well there in London. Um, so we're going to play the audio here for, for Ian's question. Hello, this is Ian Truscott. First time caller, long time listener. My question to you to celebrate your 300 episodes is imagine if you only had two choices of liquor, a Reposado tequila and some Tito's vodka. What cocktail would you make for each other to celebrate 300 episodes? Congratulations, guys. Hope you enjoy your drinking. All right, Joe, how about it? Your favorite cocktail? What uh, what, do, what do you got? You know, it's so your your answer is going to be a thousand times better than my answer. <laughs> <laughs> because you know that when I ha have a cocktail of choice, I'm a Tito's and tonic. I'm yes. a vodka tonic. I prefer Tito's. Uh, it's very, very boring. It's not exciting at all. But I'll add to that. And this is you're going to think this is so stupid. There's an and I don't like any any seltzers. I don't like White Claw. I don't like Vizzy. I don't like any of them. But there's an Astra seltzer that tastes like red cream soda. That is to die for not a <laughs> cocktail. It's like drinking red pop. It has alcohol in it. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm all in. But anyways, it's a Tito's and tonic. How about yours? Nice. Um, you know, mine is also going to be pretty straightforward because my favorite, um, it will come as a surprise to no one who has listened to this show for any amount of time. Um, that my favorite is basically a really, really fine Anejo tequila pretty much straight up, um, you know, straight, you know, maybe one big rock in it, um, just to cool things down a little bit, but a really tasty, a Don Julio, 1942, uh, a mandala. Um, there are a number of them that I just truly, truly enjoy extra anejos usually. So way more on the darker side, um, and extra aged, um, are those and, and, and really with not much in it, not me, you know, maybe a squeeze of lime, maybe, but probably just straight up with a big rock in it. That's my favorite cocktail of all. Not, I mean, we knew it was coming. You did yes, not. Disappoint. You knew it was coming. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you I'm know, always, if I, I always had to pick a you... favorite cocktail, like a fancy cocktail. I would probably go with a really good Manhattan. I mean, a but really you... good Manhattan is probably my favorite cocktail. But when you go out and I've seen you do this, you're either go on, Oh, I want to do tonight is tequila night. And you'll start tasting and then you might, you'll do an Anejo and maybe you kick in a Reposado here or there. Yeah. And then sometimes you're just all about the mixed drinks. Like That's you'll right. look on the menu and like, Oh, this mixed, I haven't had this, this looks before. fun. Yeah. And, and you'll be all I'm doing the poofy fun mixed drinks the rest of the night. I is absolutely right. Yes. I definitely appreciate a great craft cocktail, especially prior to a really fancy dinner. I love that. Yeah. 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 So you're open-minded. Yeah, I am. I am. I'm, 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 I'm a lover that way, Joe. You love all kinds of alcohol. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, last question, number 10, question number 10, and it comes from Rebecca uh, and it's through the email contact us form. So thank you, Rebecca, for that. Um, and I guess it's a nice one for us to finish on because as, as, as she asks, um, as you look out to the future of content marketing and content creators, what do you guys think you'll be talking about on the 400th episode? That's, by the way, if you're doing the math, it's about two years away. Yeah, so it'd be November of 24, uh, maybe December of yeah, 24. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a little less almost than the, that. Almost yeah, into 2025. Just look at it that way, by fall so, of 2024. Okay, I had, other, I had other notes written down for this, and I'm totally going a different direction. When... When you and I started in this whole thing of content marketing, we believed that it was very important to get the financial people on our side because finances and marketing go really hand in hand. They never have, but they should. We, the, the financial people hold the purse strings to the budget. They really need to understand what they're spending. The, what you're going to see in the next two to three years is the financialization of marketing. Oh, I love because, that. Because of the token. And every, everything that we are going to be doing in marketing is going to have some kind of financial component for us as organizations, as brands, as well as for our audience. 
and I'm, and I get excited talking about this because I don't know what exactly that means yet, but I really think it would be a thing. I really believe that the next stage of being an audience member is to have some, t- I don't know what it means, some type of ownership. How do we get that ownership? It's because of this thing called the blockchain and this thing within the blockchain called a token that we're able to do this. What we've just, you know, we've, we've gotten just out of the dugout with this thing. We're not even in the first inning. I told, I just told somebody this morning and we're saying, why are you so hopped up about the token? And I said, I think in the late nineties, I really missed like web one. Like I, I was there for it. I mean, I remember we had no internet and then we had internet and then we had eBay and we had Amazon and Apple and all these companies just go crazy. But I never really took advantage of that. I felt like I missed that opportunity. Now I feel like, oh my goodness, we are in the middle of this amazing revolution and I'm smack dab in the middle of it and I'm aware that it's happening. That's the, I wasn't aware 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Now I'm aware and I'm excited that I feel like I have a step up or a leg up because of this thing. So I would say everything we talk, we're going to be talking about in content marketing. We're going to have some kind of a financial component. So there you go. Well, you know, and, and we said at the very top of the show that we didn't even rehearse each other's answers here. And, and it's, and it's something that I actually, you know, it's definitely a yes. And to your, to your, uh, to your point, because I absolutely believe, believe it. So something I wrote, um, over the weekend that I'm going to be including in this, in this project that I'm talking about is I've been thinking about web 1.0 to web 3.0 and marketing and the idea of, you know, the, the, the decentralization and that idea of ownership that you just talked about and the, a fun thing, get your reaction to this, see how you like it. The, the, the sentence that I wrote is I wrote web 1.0. So marketing in web 1.0 was about helping customers find something different. Web 2.0 was about helping customers experience something different. And Web 3.0 is about helping customers create something different. And that to me is the whole idea is the co-creation opportunity yep. that tokenization provides. And that I that sense of ownership and how we can actually work together with customers to create special kinds of experiences. And I think that's what truly this new technology enables. That's fascinating. I mean, I've seen web one is read, web two, two is read, write, and web three is read, write, own. Yeah. And it's almost sim- very similar to what you're talking about. But this co-creation ownership, it's a thing that we haven't had the opportunity to experience before. So I'm, yeah. I think we're definitely on the same. So, so maybe we should be on for another 100 episodes. I maybe think so. Yeah. You know, the, when we do this, the next video one, so it'll be two, two and a half years from now or whatever it is. And we're going to be, I'm going to have absolutely no hair. You're going to have a big, long white beard. <laughs> hey, sunny boy. Content marketing. <laughs> Let's stay it. golden, pony boy. <laughs> oh, you're still going to be upset because you're going to st- say two, it's been 2025 and they're still not calling it content marketing. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's going to happen. <laughs> right. And I'm still going to be, you know, I'm still going to be like, you know, the sponsor in 2025 is going to be like, here you go to uh, fintechtokenmarketing.com slash Joe for, <laughs> for your advertisement. Um, yeah, that's where we're going to be. And by the way, the Browns and Cowboys will probably still be middling teams. <laughs> oh, maybe 20. Yeah, maybe 24. A 25 Super Bowl is the year the Browns and Cowboys meet. Wouldn't that be something? Okay, that, here's the, there you go. If, when it's the Browns date. and Cowboys go to the Super Bowl, you and I are going together. Oh, and and we should do a live show from the. Super oh my Bowl. gosh, it that's totally that's totally going to be a thing. Yeah, it'd be great Absolutely. if it was this year, but unfortunately, not maybe well, for you, but not for us. But my friend, 300 episodes has been a true joy in my life, and uh, thank you for 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 being there and for coming along on the ride. This has been this has been a, a, a wonderful time spent. We went we've gone way over our normal hour, but I think it's been a, a totally fun ride. No, I mean when people ask me like how have you how have you lasted eight seven eight years, I said, uh, well, if you're gonna have a co-host, that make sure that he or she or they are your friends. Ah, so well, it just makes it a lot easier. And, lot and basically easier. it's not, it's not work, right? 
Yeah, we, we just get on the phone and chat and hopefully we're helpful to people. And yeah, exactly. All we're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. That's it. I mean, you've now gotten the full Monty of 300 episodes of this old marketing. And if you want to get all the good, if you ever wanted to see me do this, folks, this is me doing this, the sort of wrap up of the show. The goodness of this podcast, wonderful, wonderful show notes, all the stuff that we talked about. We don't really have any links to talk about in this uh, in this particular episode, but if you want to go listen to it again, if you want to go see our show notes for it, if you just want to like you know hang out, get on over to our site. It's thisoldmarketing.site where you can listen to the other 299 episodes. You can get all the show notes. You can get the links. Especially good was our last week's uh, episode where we talked about all the things that are wonderful to Joe and I over our Thanksgiving episode. So a great episode if you're looking for links otherwise here we go we're going to start next week with episode number 301 and we're going to get up there to our 400th episode so until we meet again remember it's your story to tell you tell it well we'll see you next week on this old market hello this is the joe from robert Congratulations to you on your 300th episode of Joe's Podcast. Oh, Joe, you couldn't be better, but you are, and that's what we love about you, Joe. From Robert. You can do anything you want to do, guys, and if you want it done right, do it yourself. Hey, 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 h